Um, the first thing I want to do is just make sure that we all have a good sense of the definition, a couple of definitions we're using. They're both from the Department of Energy. Um, and the first is on this notion of grid interactive efficient buildings. This one comes from the, 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 the building technology, and it's an uh, energy efficient building with smart technologies characterized by active use of demand energy resources to optimize energy use for grid services, occupant needs and preference and preferences and cost reductions in continuous and integrated way. And then grid modernization is really uh, looking at uh, that it has to improve reliability for everyday operations, enhance security, uh, and uh, add additional affordability to maintain our economic prosperity and provide superior flexibility for the varied and, and still uncertain um, energy sources of the future, right? So it's got to be adaptable. And so that, that, uh, those are just a couple definitions we're using. We're not making them up. We're just creating things from whole cloth. But as we walk into this conversation, it's worth just starting with some uh, common understanding of the terms that we're using. Those are the only two that really came up. Um, and so with that, the, the first thing we're going to do here is have a series of lightning round presentations. Uh, we've got five presentations teed up, and I'm going to walk you through who the folks are. We've got Dan Oss, who's the Management Consultant of Energy and Environment Economics at Inc. Uh, he's going to kick us off here in a minute uh, with his expertise on the economic side for the next one. And uh, Jerry Mandel is main director at RMI. Uh, everyone knows RMI, so he, he uh, has a real focus on building program and cost-effective and market-based solutions. And Marco Petroni with uh, research scientists at LBNL. Um, and so uh, I think the, 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 the National Lab is going to dive deep into the technology. Uh, and uh, Paul Rhodes is Director of Engineering at RSR Realty, so um, as we get in the morning, we're going to have somebody with a, a real estate focus coming at this for us to, to blend out the panel. And then we have uh, Eric Wilson, who's the Senior Research Engineer at NREL, uh, again, more on the technology side. And Andrew Parker, also with NREL, uh, they're all going to be on the technology side. That's the last one, right? All right. So um, you, I encourage you, by the way, I, I did all of those short trips, but nobody wants to listen to me read um, descriptions. Uh, when the slides are made available, I encourage you to realize who these experts are. They're all really uh, kind of at the top of their class and what they're doing, or they wouldn't be on this panel. So many thanks to each of them for spending time to do the prep. Um, that's really the most important, and to share what they uh, have to offer with us today. So with that, we're, uh, again, we're going to go through a series of these. We're not going to break for questions in between. This is all, but I do encourage you, uh, be thinking about what they're talking about from the technical basis, because that's really what we're then going to dive into. This is intended to get our juices flowing and get us all with kind of a baseline of, 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 of thinking going before we actually dive into a conversation. So uh, let's get started, and I believe Dan is first. So welcome, Dan. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, am I just going to ask you to advance the slides when I'm ready? Is that the best way to go? Sure. Great. All right, so you can just go to the next slide. Thanks. So we're, I'm, my name is Dan Oss. I work for a company called E3. We're a San Francisco-based energy consulting firm, uh, though we do have offices now in New York and Boston, so we have a presence in the Northeast. And my uh, goal today is to talk about electrification and peak heat, both drawing out the challenges and solutions of that peak heat challenge, um, which I'll get to in to the finding in just one second. Next slide, please. But two key takeaways I want you to um, draw from this talk are that one, heat electrification holds potential to drive large new infrastructure investments to serve peak loads, particularly winter peak loads. Uh, but don't panic, there are solutions. And the solutions uh, and will rely on a number of different measures, but I'm going to talk about two main ones today. The first is energy efficiency and how critical energy efficiency will be to make zero uh, carbon control buildings a reality. And the other is offering that perhaps there'll be room for hybrid approaches um, that use a combination of electricity and some sort of backup in existing buildings. Next slide, please. So what is the peak heat challenge? Uh, the major challenge with peak heat is that the load the energy system serves, particularly for heating is very seasonal. So uh, our sort of peak to average loads for heating buildings can exceed a factor of five or more. 
And what that means is today our natural gas and fuel oil delivery systems are sized to meet that peak load. So our gas systems have enough capacity and our fuel oil delivery systems have enough capacity to deliver um, peak loads. And on this chart what I've done is put those different fuel delivery systems, both building thermal delivery in natural gas and oil and electric on the same scale in gigawatts uh, hourly during 2015. And what you can see is that our, on, on peak, our building thermal loads dwarf our existing electric system uh, capacity. Uh, so what that, the key takeaway is, is we'll need to think about how we're going to manage that capacity challenge during those really, really cold hours of the year. Next slide, please. But heat pumps can heat efficiently, even in cold weather. So what this graph shows is we've taken that building thermal load and just assume that we can get something on the order of a COP, a coefficient of performance of 1.5 during the coldest hour of the year. So we really uh, trim the amount of energy that needs to be delivered to a home or building by a lot, but we're still looking at a pretty high amount of electric load relative to that image we just saw on the previous slide. If we can jump to the next slide, please. And this puts uh, this in, in context, just adds that heating load from the previous slide to the electric load from two slides ago. And what you can see is if we were to just do this sort of naive, uh, you know, reasonably efficient electrification, we would have 60 gigawatts of new firm capacity needed to meet peak loads in the cold year, which is roughly double the current uh, capacity of New York and New England, uh, which, sorry, I have to clarify, is what I'm showing in these graphs. So that is uh, clearly a substantial challenge, but not one that we can't solve. Next slide, please. So this example is showing perhaps uh, one strategy to do that. How can we manage these peak loads with energy efficiency? And in our modeling, all we've really done here is assume two things are different. The first is that we've assumed best available air source heat pumps are available today. So we're having a COP of greater than 2.5 on peak. So that's a COP of 2.5 below freezing, effectively. Uh, and we've assumed that there is a sort of widespread attempt to weatherize and do uh, essentially measures that reduce the thermal demands of buildings. And between those two measures, we've achieved, in, by stroke of modeling fiat, a 50 gigawatt reduction in winter peak loads. So you can do a simple sort of back of the envelope calculation of what that would, um, what the avoided cost that would, that would enable in terms of generation, transmission, and distribution capacity, and you get to a number that is close, that's over $10 billion a year. So that's one strategy to mitigate uh, peak heat challenges. Uh, next slide, please. But hybrid heat pumps could also be an alternative strategy and what I mean by hybrid heat pumps are heat pumps that uh, use a air source heat pump during the vast majority of heating hours during the year, but rely on a furnace or a boiler for peak capacity provision. And this is an interesting idea that uh, is getting more and more attention in places like the United Kingdom, uh, where we're sort of thinking, okay, we have one energy system that's already sized to serve as peak load. To what degree should we think about taking advantage of that? And what are the trade-offs in a broader economy-wide carbon neutral context. So what would it take to achieve carbon neutrality if we had still had some backup heating in homes? Um, one potential reason why the strategy could be worthwhile is it doesn't require a sort of door-by-door, house-by-house uh, set of building retrofits. So it's sort of a trade-off between uh, deep retrofits and maintaining our existing uh, fossil fuel delivery infrastructure for peak provision purposes alone. Um, there are a number of other strategies that I don't have time to go into today, but for instance, you could achieve a similar result uh, using ground source heat pumps, uh, which you know, don't have the same sort of uh, efficiency degradation as a function of outdoor temperature as air source heat pumps. Uh, so there will certainly be a role for those. And then I think uh, my colleagues on this panel will be going into um, this in great, much more detail, but load flexibility will certainly play a substantial role uh, in helping us think about how can we shift load away from those really, really strained hours from a capacity perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, just given sort of a high-level description of a sort of a, I guess I'm trying to uh, put the stakes out there, that electrification of heating, achieving carbon neutral buildings will increase winter peak demands, uh, but those peak challenges are solvable through strategies like energy efficiency, hybridization, and as well as some of the other measures that I didn't go through today um, that my uh, fellow panelists, I think, will cover in some detail. Um, so that's it for me in this lightning talk. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Dan, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I'm sure that uh, <coughs> folks may have some follow-up on that when we get into our uh, discussion mode. So uh, Jamie Mandel, you're next. Are 
Great. Um, thank you. And I'm happy to be following Dan. I think I can build on a lot of what he covered. Um, I guess next slide. Um, so I'll be talking about the role that grid interactive efficient buildings can play. Um, I have a few key messages to run through. Um, I think at the beginning, this repeats what Dan said, electrification will increase load and shift peak times, most likely to the winter. An increasing amount of variable renewables on the grid will make the timing of electricity use, especially peak, more valuable. Um, and without coordination, simultaneous investments in both electrification and a variable renewable electricity supply um, can increase the total costs. Um, we believe very strongly that grid interactive efficient buildings um, can play that coordinating role. And so lower the capital needs for both electrification and a low carbon electricity supply. Um, we analyze and we'll go through um, a GEBS analysis for a DOE reference building uh, in New York uh, under current rate structures and can show sort of both the value and, and potential measures. Um, and then we looked at a high level at dispatching that same flexibility against um, wholesale grid costs and carbon and saw benefits for both. Um, so we think there's additional value as well. Um, and I'll, I'll talk if there's time a little bit about uh, low carbon rate structures um, or rate structures that can support low carbon grid. Next slide. Um, so this is a New Jersey example, um, not New York, but we hope is similar. Um, the point on the left is that electrification will decrease fuel use uh, relatively substantially. Um, New York might move faster than what's shown here based on their goals. Um, on the right, it also shows that electrification while reducing fuel use will also shift the time and, uh, of peak to winter months, which Dan made um, pretty strongly. Next slide. Um, building peaks drive grid peaks um, and electrification will make this even more true. So here what we see is annual electricity demand at a national level. Um, we see, you know, a potential substantial grid infrastructure is being spent to meet uh, peak demand being caused by buildings that occurs less than 1% of the time, making those peak times the most expensive and likely carbon intensive power source. Um, so when we look at grid interactive efficient buildings, managing those rare peaks becomes really critical. Um, I would say even within the context of high seasonal peaks, which Dan talked about, this ability to manage um, coincident peaks that occur uh, during short periods of time will have substantial value in lowering investment costs. Um, and I would lump EV uh, charging, so electrification of, of mobility into the same trend. Next slide, please. Uh, so grid interactive efficient buildings um, can help buildings shape load profiles in beneficial ways. I, I think demand response, I would say, is a subset of this. Um, but in many cases, this is an opportunity to have consistent load shaping uh, without impacting residents. So on the left, you have a typical commercial building. Um, as you move over to the right, you look a grid interactive efficient building should have both a low and often a flat load shape um, or one that can respond to signals. Next slide. In New York City, we looked at a 500,000 square foot DOE reference building, a commercial office, um, and found that um, even in an electrified heat pump scenario, uh, grid interactive efficient buildings can provide substantial savings using current rate structures. Um, what you'll see is um, a lot of benefit comes from an efficiency measure, increased air filtration and reduced ventilation, um, but staging air handling unit fans and staging your heat pumps, if it's a multi-zonal or multi-unit heat pump, which was assumed here, can have pretty dramatic benefits. Um, you'll also see LED retrofits being substantial. So roughly half of the benefits are coming from flexibility, half from efficiency, which is what you would expect. Next slide. Um, so you can apply those same flexibility resources to um, locational marginal pricing in zone J. Uh, we did this kind of at a, at a spreadsheet level and hope to go much deeper. And I guess we'd say there's substantial potential grid cost savings if you can dispatch this effectively against grid costs. Um, it, what we found is it was comparable to the building owner value that I showed on the previous slide. Um, we haven't yet estimated the full potential savings stack. And so I don't have a chart here to show you today. Next slide. Um, you can dispatch those same, that same flexibility against emissions. Our colleagues at what time uh, did this analysis and I'm sharing their slide with permission. Um, right now, there's relatively low um, marginal emissions differentiation in New York, but we expect that to increase pretty dramatically as renewables increase on the grid. Uh, even so, you can see um, with 
relatively limited flexibility and increase of two uh, to three percent in emission savings uh, by dispatching flexibility against that. Next slide. Um, so what do we think about all of this? I think at the building level, level um, investing in fully controllable systems becomes really powerful. Thinking about demand management in a consistent way as opposed to an event driven way like DR, I think is really useful. Um, storage plays a critical role in figuring out how to incentivize uh, and clear the red tape for more storage can be pretty valuable, both thermal storage and electrical storage. Um, and thinking about tailoring rebates and incentives um, to really focus on the measures that can provide flexibility as rate structures evolve. Next slide. Um, I'll conclude here really quickly. Um, if we look at emissions, um, having rates that tie to emissions as you decarbonize the grid can make a lot of sense in lowering costs. Um, we don't necessarily know when periods of high and low emissions will occur ahead of time. And so creating a dynamic flexibility as opposed to static flexibility. So leveraging controls in addition to um, efficiency measures can be really valuable. Um, as curtailment starts to become an issue on the grid, you're going to see the greatest emissions benefits shifting from uh, reducing peak demand to reducing curtailment and figure out how to create rate structures that can manage both um, needs simultaneously will be important. Um, so we do see good correlation today between wholesale price and emissions. So there's an opportunity to tie those together and begin building emissions responsive rate structures that buildings can respond to um, already. And that sets a foundation for um, evolutions going forward. And I will uh, wrap up there and, and thank you guys for the time. Jamie, thank you. That's uh, really helpful and continues to build a, a nice foundation for us as we move forward. Uh, Marco Petroni with uh, uh, LBNL is next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Welcome. Okay, so uh, I guess next slide. Well, um, so I'm a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I work um, um, mostly boot on the ground, so on implementing the things that you guys wanna um, you're, you're talking about. And um, this is the way. So in five minutes, this is my way of conveying the challenges in actually doing it. Uh, the way I think about electrification is that uh, when and we all know why we're doing this. Uh, uh, mostly driven by trying to de decarbonize our uh, system, uh, you will have an impact on on the grid. As we we say, we have the duck curve there in California on the right, and the alligator curve. There's a bunch of other animals that you may be familiar with or not, uh, but these are uh, problems that are currently occurring. They're not in the future. 2020 is like in a month. Um, the other piece uh, that is impacted by electrification is reliability and resiliency. So uh, you see the, the fires in California and people trying to fix poles. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but th th it was a so PGE went bankrupt uh, a few months ago uh, due to the fires. Um, uh, I was personally uh, affected by the power uh, shutoffs, uh, which happened. Uh, to min minimize risk for PGD, which could be, you know, financial risk or, or actually uh, uh, fire risks. Uh, but what happens is you're, uh, um, you're uh, blocking, you're stopping electricity. And I was lucky I had the gas system in my house. So I could take a shower and wash my two year, year old. Um, but if you don't have that and you go completely electrical, you have to think about storage in some way. So um, next slide. Um, uh, LBNL does a lot of research on grid interactive buildings, uh, both for DOE and for other um, uh, agencies, including California Energy Commission. Uh, we have a lot of history in demand response. Uh, Marianne, who's my boss, has done you know demand response for 20 years. We have a great team that does advanced controls and analytics. Uh, we create open source software that people can pick up and use. Uh, we look at microgrid storage and other things. So you can see here on the on the right, there's a couple of diagrams from the uh, GEB um, um, report that was mentioned before by other presenters. And on the top, there's like different type of grid services that uh, were developed for a, a response potential study in California, from shape to shift and shimmy, all type of uh, um, uh, changes in the load shapes that buildings can 
can adapt to. Next slide. Uh, having only five minutes, I want to talk uh, to you about this uh, project we have in California, where we took a gas station in a fairly uh, remote area in California, and we said, okay, how can this become a center for resiliency? And it's in a place uh, that has uh, both storage and efficient use of electricity. And the reason why we're doing this is because there's tons of gas stations around the um, around California and the US. And with the EV revolution, that may be turned in the future in centers of uh, um, charging for, for EVs. In addition, uh, this, uh, they become centers for people that are in um, emergency to go and get their fuels and do other things. So we uh, created a microgrid at gas station level, which is fairly small. Uh, this creates uh, a bunch of challenges that uh, are mostly due to the fact that the costs for uh, connecting to the grid for a microgrid are uh, incredibly high, around fifty to hundred thousand dollars for engineering and materials and et cetera. Uh, there's very few options for controls of these buildings in, in existing uh, commercial systems. And uh, even if you get can get a battery from one vendor and PV from the others, and maybe a control system for the building, they don't really coordinate. Um, next slide. So what we have done is, uh, this is the, the, our partner. We were partnering with Humboldt State University and, and an Indian um, tribe in Northern California. Uh, we took this gas station, deployed uh, PVs. We controlled the, the freezer and the fridge, walk-in uh, walk freezer and fridge, uh, thermostats uh, and rooftop units. We control uh, batteries and we develop a software stack uh, that is op open source and there's also a piece of hardware that can decrease the cost for deployment of the system. And next slide. Um, this is, you know, why we're doing this, you know, why we're obsessed with gas stations or small buildings. Well, because, you know, gas stations are a central piece of the critical infrastructure. You can see uh, people getting energy, water, food. Uh, there's a, you know, small convenience store on place. Um, there's really a need for re resilience packages uh, for fuel stations and uh, convenience stores that are not available now. And they can also be scaled up very quickly because a gas station is fairly similar to any other gas station. Uh, a couple of events uh, to give you an idea of, of you know, why this is critical. Uh, this is 2018. Uh, gas Buddy uh, uh, had a list of uh, uh, stations in um, um, North Carolina where uh, you could have both uh, uh, fuel and power, and none of them had both either, you know, both of them. So uh, it's it's a real, real serious problem. Uh, another thing is this is the power shot off in California a few months ago here. Uh, 700,000 people were affected, and uh, you get, you know, no power, no nothing. And having uh, battery systems and something that can isolate and work independently from the grid becomes a uh, Fundamental, especially if you are completely electrified. Next slide. So I'm gonna end uh, with technical challenges. So we do a lot of simulation also here, here at the lab to, you know, establish what is possible and what is not a big picture. But what I'm trying to convey here is there's a lot of technical issues at the lower level where both technical products are not necessarily available. The economics are not necessarily there. There's a very high capital cost. Um, and I'm talking about mostly small commercial buildings, but it's a different you know, type of problem for residential, small commercial, and large commercial. And on the policy side, the uh, cost for um, um, uh, interconnection is very high. In addition, and this is also something that uh, DOE is is working on is is very hard to measure flexibility. So somebody mentioned before, you know, putting this in code, uh, and I agree that would be great. But measuring it efficiency is fairly easy. You can sum it up, you know, everywhere. But flexibility has a spatial and a temporal component that may very hard to define. You know what your profile should be and what your behavior should be without knowing data for a specific. Thing. So this is my. Contribution. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marco. Um, let's see, Paul, Paul Road uh, with RXR Realty is next. All right, thank you. Paul? Uh, yeah, turn the mic on, please, and keep it close to you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, board one slide then. I'll start the discussion with, uh, and if you could just, yeah, let's pull the items up. I'll start the discussion with the electrification of commercial buildings from the perspective of an operator and developer of large commercial buildings uh, here and in the suburbs. Uh, I, I first have to say that our primary focus is on density and on providing an environment and a space for our tenants to perform in. All right, so you know the, the buildings exist to create business opportunities for the tenants for the tenants to execute on that business. And so we are completely focused on on providing these contracts that allow that to happen. Taking a step back from that, I, we do believe that there's uh, still a tremendous amount of waste in, in the existing building stock and in designs of these buildings that can be wrung out um, and that can be easier to bring out, uh, you know, obviously as we design buildings from the ground up. Uh, and we think those new designs incorporating items that allow tenants themselves to have zero touch mechanisms or, or processes that will allow them to use just the energy they need at the point they need to use it without thinking about it. So, these, so the development of what I call zero touch tenant energy management systems will be paramount in these buildings and actually adds the flexibility that we've been hearing about. I also talked about flexibility or mentioned flexibility out there. What I mean by that is space flexibility. The idea of being able to reconfigure space instead of redeploying tenants when they've changed their business functions is extremely important. And also developing shared services or shared floors uh, in, in buildings to reduce, to reduce energy. So having you know, some sort of all the pantries that are located on one floor instead of a pantry in every tenant space actually does save a tremendous amount of energy is more hygienic. And, and uh, it was a sort of the goal of lowering the electric envelope to allow room for heating to crowbar its way in there. Uh, use of passive measures. Uh, in new buildings, this is the opportunity to have high performing wall systems, having uh, you know, natural lighting systems, heat recovery, uh, and, and again, you know, and wellness measures uh, built in. We see this as a paramount um, initiative among all new buildings uh, and, and now, uh, frankly, easier to quantify than in the past. Um, also, on the technical side, the new, you know, all our new buildings are going to have to have a much finer look at turn, or what we call turndown ratios or the, the ability of the equipment to provide its conditioning just where it's needed as opposed to half the building, you know, and, and one extra space. And we find that buildings are used now much more than they were in the past. In the past, you could go into a building at seven o'clock and only run into cleaners. Now you'll go into the building and you know at nine, ten o'clock at night, and they're still fairly well populated, but the building systems to support that population are wasting energy. So we wanted to have systems that match the use of of, of the other tenants in the building. And, and frankly, there's a number of systems I can talk about that achieve this. Um, yeah, the other uh, few items I'd like to talk about is controls. Use of controls. We've heard about it somewhat before. It's the control industry, unfortunately, is still, is still segmented. And there, are, there are environmental controls, there are elevator controls, there are card access and, and metering. And in order to achieve a, a more optimized use of energy in the building and allow flexibility and load management, we're going to need to integrate those controls together. And that is happening right now. And the integration doesn't necessarily have to happen at the building level. In fact, I think it'll probably happen at the cloud level. And, uh, and, and building controls, of, you know, frankly, in, in the future are migrating towards the point where the analytics and the control logic is in the cloud and the points are in the building and, and the two work with each other with some sort of mechanism of detect the building some communication out. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, obviously the big question of the room uh, from a thermal perspective is uh, electric facilitated heating. I call it that because obviously what we would try and do is to do DR systems or air cooled heat pumps, water cooled heat pumps with geothermal connections. The idea obviously is to stop burning fuel in, in the buildings and, and, and not setting up new buildings that way. And then finally, uh, we don't see many new buildings. Uh, started uh, or get out of the, the design development stage without serious consideration for electric and thermal storage. I do draw a distinction and for 
for a thermal storage, I, I, I am also including uh, thermal heat storage as opposed to thermal uh, storage for cooling, uh, geothermal, solar, and power management systems. And power management systems I put on there because I do believe from a resiliency perspective down the road, not, not immediately down the road, but maybe 10 or 15 years down the road, we're, we're going to, from a building owner perspective, have to contend with a, a grid that may not be as stable locally as we're used to. And, or even our, our, our own building with all of these uh, assets that pull power and push power into the local spot network and into the, into the local utility networks, we're going to want to have um, industrial level power control that will allow us to do frequency stabilization, better load management, and just have a much, much more robust control over what comes into the building and what leaves the building so that our tenants can stay, uh, stay doing their jobs. We go one step further here. Now, existing buildings are slightly different. Same focus on the tenants, but I don't have as many tools available to me to deploy these buildings because they're fixed assets. That being said, zero touch tenant energy management strategies is still a field that we have to push into. And by the way, second time I've used that term zero touch is because we've tried for the last five years to have tenants brought into the energy management um, process is very, very hard to do. Energy from a tenant perspective is a very small cost compared to rent. And uh, it's not their business. And so what the tap we're taking now is to develop these programs that they really just have to sign up for. And then we, we go ahead and, and, and the classic example that would be going to, you know, sort of an egress fighting and just, or like a functional occupancy mode during during a demand event or an event when we want to pull energy out of their space, having us help them uh, design their space so that there's, you know, there's not half a dozen supplemental systems running all the time, just what they need when they need it. But just moving down the list here, uh, it's incremental deployment of passive measures with fit outs and major restorations. I think we heard a reference to that before, that the opportunity in existing buildings is during major retrofits and during tenant fit outs, and then the good aspect of, of making the buildings basically easier to keep uh, can be done very incrementally. You can afford the time and space the time. And so I don't have to do the massive recladding the building. I can sort of reclad from the inside of the building and get good incremental results at, at a marginal cost increase that makes sense from a payback perspective. Um, energy efficiency is interesting. Looking out 5, 10, 15 years into 2050, I still see energy efficiency as carrying the day from the perspective of protecting the asset value of these buildings. And that is because I do think there's going to be a lot of cost pressure on the cost of power. And in order to mitigate that, we're going to have to bring all of the waste out that we can. And so we will do that by continually uh, looking for ways to, to lower the load. And that's lighting, HVAC, power management. Again, I go into deeper use of controls uh, uh, here as well in existing buildings. And existing buildings lend themselves to the Internet of Things type approach in which we have existing systems, but by connecting them up to some, some cloud services, we can have better coordination between the different elements. And what I mean by better coordination is you know, you know, lighting just on where I need it after hours, um, knowing that the, the peak of the building during the day, we all are familiar with these building curves. Um, but what worries me not so much is the peak during the day, but it's the trough during the night. You know, why do I have five megawatts on at 12 to 5 hours in America is at 2 a.m. in the morning? You know, in the daytime, it's 10 megawatts. I, I, I don't understand that. So we're going to, we, we want to find ways to pull those things down. A, a big tool will be uh, broader and deeper use of control. Uh, gas, well, yeah, gas, any buildings that are heated by oil, and steam, most of ours are, are steam, are going to remain that way. Uh, in, in, until, the, until the buildings age out or the, the penalties on using gas that become some onerous that uh, it, it pays to swap out an electric boiler. Um, that being said, uh, the, the, the buildings are, are looked at from the standpoint of thermal storage, geothermal, solar power, same, the same suite of things for new buildings will look at for existing buildings. Just progress one, one page, please. All right. Residential buildings. So, and I just have one slide on, on these for new buildings. Are, you know, we're building 70, about 7,000 or greater number of apartments in around Manhattan. Uh, siting of the buildings is, is very important from a, a, a load 
management perspective, partly because you put your building basically within walking distance of transportation infrastructure, you're at least allowing for the tenants in the building not have to have a car to commute, and you're allowing for yourself not to have to build the infrastructure to support them having those cars. So siting of the buildings becomes a, a measure as much that we have to think about as, as much as anything else. Again, use the past measures, high efficiency windows, insulation, when you throw in the lower heating load as much as I can prior to applying uh, electric. Uh, heating from air cooled heat pumps, we're, we're seeing all sorts of, of innovations come out, CO2 based heat pumps, uh, heat pumps that, uh, you know, obviously it's not an innovation, it's a geothermal heat pumps. People are talking about them now as a their innovation, but we see great promise in that and are going at ourselves. So, you know, electric boilers or resistance coils at some point will be what you're looking at if you're in a moratorium zone. I know that, you know, lately that the, the moratorium has been lifted, but we would actually move to an electric solution before going to an oil solution in some of our, our new buildings just from a future proofing perspective. Control of touching all energy consuming equipment in buildings. Um, it's an absolute, absolute must in residential buildings. Um, most of the staff there tend to be near and more of the thinking about what happens with the central system has to be done automatically. Zero touch energy uh, involvement programs, basically that's your net type uh, arrangement with the thermostats and the, and the tenants in the buildings, but enable, ev enabling everything for them. So they literally just say yes on a monthly rent statement and oh, they, they get to participate in the program and something good will happen for them. And thermal or energy storage and solar, again, another component here in these buildings. So we're seeing on existing buildings, new buildings, commercial and residential, we're seeing that we're really looking at every one of these buildings and seeing where we can apply some solar and some thermal storage. The tricky part here is trying to figure out how to model the return on investment for that because we're making guesses about where the cost of power will be. Slight changes in those assumptions cause these projects to look very good or very poor. So hopefully we'll get some resolution on that in the near term. Let's just go one more slide, please. And bring these all up. So now I'll talk a little bit about grid modernization uh, uh, for the electrified buildings. A couple, a couple things from an operator perspective, and this is, I will say, more commercial oriented than anything else. Um, we, we are nervous that, you know, as this, as people migrate to electrified buildings over the next 15 years, the grid will be under threat. And there's a lot happening to this grid. I can't be the only developer thinking about putting solar up on these buildings and doing power management systems. And so my neighbors are doing things different. The grid is going to be fed, you know, differently, let's say. And, and so, um, you know, we, we have to insulate ourselves from what could happen to us, outages, uh, you know, crazy frequency imbalances, voltage um, dips and sags. And so that, that's first and foremost in our mind right now. Um, we do believe we're going to have buildings very shortly that will be able to demand limit um, or load limit at a much greater at a much greater volume than they currently do. In fact, demand limiting in most commercial buildings now is it, 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 it's sort of a very passive item. It's you know what can you do without affecting any tenant or any, anything you can see um, in the tenant space. But when we pull the tenants into that equation, and as we design these buildings to, to, to be able to, to pull down systems for greater periods of time, you'll see deeper, deeper pockets of re reduction, uh, like we saw on the, on, the, on the chart from RMI, and uh, that will have an effect on my, on, you know, on my neighbors and on the grid, and we'll have to have systems to deal with that. The grid will also have to be reinforced to accommodate swings in power and frequency that we're going to see. Currently, the grid is somewhat fragile in parts of Manhattan. It, it, where it's underbuilt, it, it, it's a problem. Uh, and uh, I don't, I, you know, it's just going for an interconnection uh, agreement a couple years ago when uh, across Manhattan, these different spot networks you learn by the degree of work that the local utility has to do how fragile some of the connection points are. So I do believe the grid will have to be will have to be, um, uh, you know, reinforced, and it'll have to be reinforced from the perspective of a portional bidirectional flow in and out between nodes in the grid. There might be periods of time, you know, in the middle of the night when my commercial office building is actually discharging. I mean, the rule of thumb is, is, is that, you know, if I have a battery system, will be charging at night, discharging during the day. Well, it may, it may turn out in the wintertime, it's discharging at night because it's surrounded by some residential building. 
And then, um, uh, you know, and, and, and again, as a, as a major uh, protector against uh, grid anomalies, uh, power quality metering is going to be an absolute must. We're going to have to look at more than just the load. We're going to have to look at the waveforms, phase angles, all the metadata that comes with the power so that our in-house systems can combat uh, what might be happening that is uh, uh, improper or not, uh, not productive to keeping the building going to keep the tenants safe. And finally, on communication infrastructure, um, you know, right now we get power. And if we want to do demand lending, you know, we get a phone call and an email. That's completely ridiculous in an age of continuous interaction with the grid. So, I mean, we do foresee, you know, uh, you know local pricing being established at a much more granular level. And the, the buildings collect data. And, and while the utility has to serve our building, you know, we, we will also have the opportunity to push back into the local node and do what we can to advantage uh, a, set of, a set of prices or a set of calls that uh, the grid has. And so demand frequency response programs at the building level, followed by pricing, followed by communi you know, communication streams that go with the power. So we'll get power, we'll get a communication stream, stream that our, our systems can work with, and probably a business system that's uh, real time as, as well, will enable us to justify the project investments that we need to, uh, to build it on the outside. That's what I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much. Um, Let's see, I think last we've got the tag team of Eric Wilson and Andrew Parker, both with Enro. Right. Yes. Hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, welcome. Great. Uh, this is Eric Wilson, and my colleague Andrew Parker is joining me. And we're going to be kind of taking things up in scale and talking about our work doing building stock modeling to look at. Uh, uh, electrification, large scale electrification of the building stock and, and impacts on the grid and, and uh, resilience. <clears throat> Just let us know if you want the slide to go forward, okay? Great, thank you. Next slide, Pete, please. So uh, I'm gonna start things off by going through uh, little example of why we think it's important to 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 do uh modeling of of the building stock um so Eric, you want to be on 64 or 65. Uh, yeah this uh 60 yeah. sorry it wasn't it wasn't yeah. updating uh, the, yep this is great uh, i'll talk from here so um <laughs> just uh just to do this this illustrative example Imagine uh, you have a neighborhood or, or a single um, ranch home in, say, Chicago. Could be UNORC, but I'm using Chicago weather here. And look at uh, a cold week where it gets uh, below zero Fahrenheit out, on, uh, as you can see on the graph below, on that January 29th day. And you say, OK, um, let's, let's electrify this home. It has a, a gas furnace. You can see the, the whole home electric load on average for this neighborhood. On that January 29th day, for a gas furnace, it was you know very low. Um, you know maybe it went up a little bit because of the the furnace fan is is running. And then you if you just electrify it with an electric furnace, you get that first line up there, um, and you can see a huge uh, peak on that January 29th day. Um, of course, putting in an electric furnace isn't very realistic, so let's put in a heat pump. And say it's a minimum efficiency heat pump when where if it's goes below zero, then you're basically resorting to using an electric furnace. So um, you're spiking just as much as that electric furnace case, and you're actually making your your peak to average ratio worse. Uh, there's more ramping going up to that that cold day. Um, well, let's try another heat pump um, that's kind of top of the line efficiency. If you could move to the next slide. Eric, let me just stop you for one second. Boogie, would you go back to the one that says gas furnace? There you go. Um, I don't know. If you, so, are you able to see this, Eric, in real time? Uh, still on 66. Okay. So, what, I, what I'm wanting only because on our screen, it, um, as you talk through it, all the, the um, all the other colors except the dominant one washed out. So if you can just talk oh. through the gas furnace again, uh, and 
assume you'll we'll move the slides with you so that people can kind of get the effect of your slide. Yep, will do. Um, yeah, so here, this is showing um, the, the gas furnace case, the, the, the home, the 1950s ranch home or neighborhood of homes starts out um, with a gas furnace. This is the whole home electric load. Um, so you can see it's kind of in the zero to five kilowatt range. Um, even on this cold day, it doesn't, doesn't take up that much. And if you go to the next slide, 65, Um, 65 is going to show what happens if you just swatch, swip, swap out that gas furnace with a uh, electric resistance furnace. So it, it peaks up around 40 kilowatts, um, which is kind of ridiculous for, for an individual home. And I'm still seeing 64. Oh, okay, 65. And then if you could go, go on to the next heat pump slide. Yep, great. So, um, so this example is showing uh, with say a cold climate, top, you know, top, top of the line efficiency heat pump. So you can see that you've reduced that, that peak that you got on that cold winter day uh, by about half. And uh, the, the efficiency gains on those milder days are even greater. Um, but still, you know, uh, could could get some issues with with uh, the the distribution grid um, if there's you know all the homes on a block that are that are putting in uh, even top of the line of, uh, efficiency heat pumps. And you know, I didn't model ground source heat pumps, but that's something that, that we can model and look at. Um, but we can also look at what happens if you add on some energy efficiency measures, improving the envelope of the building. So that's what the next slide 68 shows. Uh, if you do some really aggressive um, air sealing and ins insulation measures as part of a package, and then you put in this top of the line uh, high efficiency heat pump, you get a, a load coming out on this this cold winter day. Um, it's actually not not too different from uh, from the original gas furnace, um, of course, on a, a large scale that we're seeing here. Um, okay, I'm still seeing 67. Assume you all are seeing 68. We're on 68 now. Yeah, we're on 68 now. Great. So this is the results with that weatherization package. So um, all this goes to show, um, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the different technologies and different different levels of efficiency of envelope can have a huge effect in, in determining what the the load. Uh, the load of a building is. And when we're looking at large scale electrification, it can become very useful to model the building stock with these types of physics based models to understand the potential implications of this large scale electrification. Um, so if you move on to the next slide. I'm going to be talking through um, uh, models called ResStock and, and Comstock that, that NREL has developed for the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and these models are built on uh, and, and use um, kind of core engine simulation engine capabilities and the Energy Plus tool, uh, as well as the Open Studio SDK abilities that kind of layer on top of Energy Plus to make it easier to use. Um, and those tools are both designed to model individual buildings. And then NREL is also de developing a tool called UrbanOpt to model districts, surfaces, which leverages the, uh, the Energy Plus and Open Studio capabilities. But I'm going to be focusing on this, this third scale, uh, trying to model whole building stock at a whole city level, state, utility, territory, or national level. Um, so if you can move on to uh, next slide. And let's advance to 71. Um, so Redstock and Comstock are highly granular analysis tools for modeling the building stock at these, these different scales. Uh, and I'm just gonna talk through uh, briefly what sets these tools apart from, from other approaches. Um, let's move on to slide 72, please. Uh, so there's three three key components um, that, that 
Wake up red stock and comp stock. One is um, advanced to 73, uh, a detailed database of the characteristics of the building stock at these, these different scales. Uh, we've compiled a, a set of dozens of, of data sets, large public and private data sets that define all of the building characteristics that, are, that affect energy use um, and occupancy patterns in, in the building stock. Um, and structure these in, in such a way that there's this tree of conditional probability distributions that we sample from to generate uh, hundreds of thousands of representative building models that represent the, the diversity in all those different parameters that make up the, the building stock. And then we simulate those, if you advance to 73, I think should be on now. Um, we use uh, physics-based computer modeling to do detailed sub-hourly energy simulations of all of those represented buildings, and then advance to the 74. Um, at this large scale, we need to make use of modern high-performance computing resources, whether that's the supercomputer we have here at NREL or uh, cloud computing in order to, to simulate this, this large scale of, of simulations. Um, so what are the, the applications of these tools? I'll move on to 75, please. Um, so there's a number of applications we've, we've been, been working with utility companies and utility company consultants to look at how uh, they can increase the cost effectiveness of, of, their, of their energy efficiency uh, programs. And also um, understand maybe, maybe there's ways that they can defer the, the distribution uh, infrastructure spending in parts of their utility uh, service territories. Um, and then for manufacturers, say, of, um, of emerging technologies, um, we've seen interest in using these tools to really evaluate what the, you know, do, do some market research and understand what the potential uh, revenue is for different technologies. And maybe that can inform, you know, is there one state or city where, where they want to spend some more, uh, more dollars in terms of marketing or, or sending, sending salespeople there? Um, and then finally, cities and states, and, and, and as well as building owners, uh, are interested in using Redstock to identify just the highest priority, most economic up upgrades that can be made to the, the building stock, whether that's a portfolio of buildings or all of the buildings within a city or state. Um, and then rolling things up, understand how all those buildings and, and the, the uh, efficiency um, gains that can be made in those buildings, how that can contribute to uh, aggressive energy or, or emissions targets. I'm going to talk through one specific example on that last application. Uh, if you advance to the next slide, please. Um, so NREL has been working with this, the city of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power on a study to look at, uh, to, to look out at options to get to 100% renewable energy uh, by 2050. And um, this is a first of its kind of analysis and that we're doing this really detailed building stock modeling that's feeding into a lot of uh, simulations of the electricity grid. Um, and the key question that, that we're involved in is really trying to understand what role that buildings play in achieving 100% renewable energy, both for the city and the utility, since it is a municipal utility and accounting for various factors in, in the building stock, the growth of different sectors or building types over time, um, the uh, large scale electrification and how that plays out on uh, and impacts the electric grid. Uh, efficiency levels, looking at different, different uh, you know, aggressive or less aggressive levels of, of energy efficiency deployed throughout the building stock. And then finally, flexibility, trying to understand uh, how flexible buildings, uh, the demand from buildings can be and, and how that plays out in terms of making it easier or more difficult to achieve their, their renewable energy goals. And moving to next slide. Um, so this, this building stock modeling that we're doing is kind of feeding into all other aspects of modeling um, for this project and really understanding um, where there may be where it might be necessary to make grid infrastructure upgrades, um, you know uh, how how buildings affect uh, the need for critical transmission investments, um, um, maintaining system reliability, as well as the impact on um, equity and jobs and the local economy. Um, so that's that's one example where we're doing kind of this this uh, this uh, building stock modeling and projecting out. 
sure to get different scenarios and understand what are the large scale impacts of uh, particularly elect electrification in a place like Los Angeles um, is not going to have as big of an effect as a place like New York. Um, so it's 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 going to be really interesting to see as we start to to deploy these tools in other places and understand some of the uh, the impacts of electrification. Um, and finally, moving on to the next slide, um, I just want to put a plug out there. We are now um, working on a project funded by the U.S. Department of Energy where we're seeking uh, time series data, uh, all different types of time series data to be able to calibrate and ultimately validate uh, the res stock and comp stock models um, and their ability to produce accurate uh, end use load profiles for the building stock for the whole country. And we're going to be doing kind of deep dive calibrations in different regions. So the more data we have from a particular state or region, the better we're going to end up in terms of calibrating the model. So I wanted to put it out there if anybody um, uh, has any ideas on where we might be able to get access to uh, whole building uh, inter interval meter data, um, say from utilities, as well as um, customer class hourly load shapes for, for utilities that kind of it's aggregate um, across many buildings um, still is useful for a project, though getting the building by building uh, data is, is uh, what we really like to see. Um, and then we're also starting to look at um, going after commercial building uh, automation system data to be able to, to calibrate some of the, the end uses. Um, measurement and verification study data, and then other end use submetering data sets that are out there uh, for, for the different end uses, HVAC, water heating, lighting, refrigeration, plug loads, et cetera. Uh, so please reach out, uh, our emails are on the, the next slide. Um, and NREL has, has a history of working with sensitive utility data and uh, this data is gonna be kept, kept anonymous. Uh, we're just gonna be using it to compare against our models. Um, and we do have some budget available if, if the data is kind of meets a certain need that we've identified fills a gap that we have, that we have some budget available to assist with the anonymization process uh, or transferring the, the, the data to us. So please do reach out. Um, we'd love to, to work to make our models better and more useful for, uh, for New York. Um, finally, thank you. Um, Andrew and I, our, our emails are there. And then I just wanna mention that we have a case study that came out recently looking at how uh, cities such as New York City um, can take steps to prepare for a detailed building stock analysis. So that's up on the, the ResDoc website under publications. So feel free to check that out. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention.